Okay, men, this one's for you. Hello, and welcome to, or back to, my channel. I'm Kit, and today, Classically Abby is giving advice to men and about men. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Abby, and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content she puts out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video, and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below, along with sources and resources. And now, on to the reason we're all here. Classically Abby is a YouTuber speaking on classic living, traditional values, and modern femininity, which usually involves lecturing women about modesty and the importance of motherhood. But in May, she began a series where she spoke to men and, well, I'm sure you can tell by the title of this video that there wasn't much there, but that pretty much sums Abby up. If she ever reflects or considers nuance, she doesn't do it on YouTube, where she prefers to dictate her lifestyle preferences as the way people must live. We'll be looking at five videos, two telling men how to attract a worthy woman, one lecturing men about the five women they shouldn't date, and finally, two telling women about men. Then we'll go to my final thoughts and then end on a somber note. Sound good? Great. I do want to say that not all of Abby's advice is bad. In fact, some of it is even common sense. So this will be pretty chill most of the time, but some things don't make sense and some things are just weird. The first video is five ways to look hotter to attract a woman worth marrying. And I question that title so much. I know it's to get attention, to get clicks, but does Abby consider some women not worthy of marriage? Although I suppose to Abby, it's good and right for all women to desire marriage and also good and right for men to deem certain women unworthy. This probably ties in with her don't date these women video. Abby was also on a you need attraction and compatibility for a successful relationship kick a while back, but for some reason she decided not to discuss compatibility at all and just focus on the surface. Anyway, let's get into it. Abby opens her video by noting that she's been seeing a lot of reels and YouTube shorts about men going to the barber with long scraggly hair, getting a haircut, and going from about a 3 to a 10. Is rating people on a numerical scale classic? I wouldn't think so, but Abby informs us that women are definitely less visual than men and are much more attracted to personality and to a lot of different elements about character, but it doesn't hurt to look good. And that's true. Attraction gets you in the door, though granted, attraction looks different for different people, which is why I don't like Abby's videos. She generalizes way too much. And on that note, the first thing you can do to appear more attractive is to figure out your facial hair situation. I think that every man benefits from considering what facial hair looks best on them. For some men, they don't grow facial hair well. That would be a guy who would really benefit from not having facial hair. <laughs> having patchy facial hair is just not going to work for him. There are some men who have less of a strong jawline, and so having a really nice beard can give the illusion of a stronger jawline. There are some men, few and far between, but there are some men who really look great with a mustache, a la the guy from Top Gun Maverick, right? Having a mustache makes a big difference. Figuring out what facial hair looks best on you is really going to change the game for how you look. I know there are some men who look absolutely incredible with a beard and definitely look a little less attractive without one. And just stick with what works for you. You don't have to try something new every few weeks if you know that having a beard or having a mustache or being clean shaven or having a five o'clock shadow works best for your features. Figure it out. Take the time, try different things, try different styles, see how people react to it, and then stick with it. I will say fluffy, scraggly facial hair, a big bushy beard that has no shape to it is not attractive on anybody. So taking the time to style it is going to make a big difference too. That doesn't mean that having a large beard can't work, but it does mean that having a large beard needs to take some extra effort so that you can make it look groomed and well put together. And every woman has a different preference. I know I like a man with a beard. My husband has a beard, I like it. I like it a lot. And I'm not a huge fan of guys who are clean shaven. It's just not my type. Some women prefer a man who's clean shaven. It just depends, but just take the time to figure out what looks best on you and you'll see that women are going to find you more attractive. I agree with this one, though I would base it more on what you think looks good and what you want to maintain instead of what other people thinks looks good on you. A man can look best with a full beard, but not be interested in maintaining it, for example. And it doesn't make or break attraction. For instance, 
I prefer a clean shaven look, but I've still dated men with facial hair, which is one of the reasons I think men should focus on what they want. It's their face after all, and as Abby said, different women have different preferences. It's better to go with what you like and are willing to maintain. Number two is take care of yourself physically. That means exercising and eating well. I don't think any serious woman is looking for a big bodybuilder in a husband. She's not thinking I need the guy who's in the gym three hours a day because what does that actually convey? It conveys that he's not going to have a lot of time to spend with you outside of work and his time at the gym. But I think women like a guy who looks like he takes care of himself because if he takes care of himself and his body, that means he's gonna be around and healthy longer in your lifetime. It also means that if he can take care of himself, he can take care of you. So a guy who eats healthy and pays attention to that, who exercises enough, is not only going to reflect that in the way that he looks, it also shows a certain level of responsibility that's very attractive to a woman worth marrying. And I think it's important to recognize, most women are not going to reject a guy if he doesn't have six pack abs or giant biceps. If he looks good enough, you're doing it, you're doing the thing. So just take care of your body physically, pay attention, try to get you know some muscle definition because having strong muscles means you can do more around the house, you can carry things, you can carry your children, but don't aim to look like some supermodel because at the end of the day, a guy who's spending three hours at the gym every day is spending three hours away from his spouse. I don't really follow if he can take care of himself, he can take care of you, but anyway, if someone is spending three hours at the gym every day, that's either their job or they do want to become a bodybuilder. Anyway, as in the last one, this is again something you should do for yourself, not to attract a date. Number three is get a haircut. We talked about getting your facial hair sorted, now it's time to get your hair sorted. Men look so crazy different with a good haircut. I remember there was a guy when I was about 19 who I was friends with and he had this bowl cut that was so unattractive. I took him to the barber, he got his hairstyle to a more modern look and all of a sudden he went from kind of unattractive to very attractive. Having a good haircut makes all the difference. And again, all of these attractiveness factors show and convey how much you are willing to do to be responsible. A guy with hair that looks like it's never been cut or never been washed or just messy and slovenly makes a woman think that he can't take care of himself. A guy with a haircut that is clean means that he is responsible enough to go to the barber every six weeks. It means that he knows that he needs to put some product in to make it look its best. It doesn't mean you need some crazy hairstyle, but it does mean that you need to have something that looks clean cut. And by the way, if you have a haircut that is clean and well styled, it also looks like you could get a job and hold a job. Because most men who are in a real workplace need to have a clean haircut. So all of that is great. It's attractive from just the fact that it looks nice, but it's also attractive because it shows that you have got it together. Is anyone else surprised to hear that Abby once had a male friend because I sure am. Anyway, yes, I would agree that it's important to upkeep your hair, though Abby does sound older than her years when she talks about a clean haircut, indicating a man will be able to get and keep a job. Also, when I try to Google clean haircut, it's just short hair. And I just want to say that men can have long hair and it doesn't look messy or unprofessional if they do. Number four is improve your style. Most men I know do not know how to dress. They look like a mess. They don't know how to choose pants. They don't know how to choose shirts. They don't know how to pair things. They don't know how to figure out what fits them. Take some time and figure out what looks good on you. Wear things that fit you well. Get them tailored. Get nice suits. Don't wear things that are just messy looking. And make sure that your clothing really reflects what you want from a spouse. If you're wearing clothing that looks like you have got it together, you're going to attract someone who has it together. If you're wearing clothing that looks like you can hold down a job, or you're wearing clothing that looks like you could go to a nice dinner date, that is going to attract a woman worth marrying because she can see that you have your life together and can be a supportive husband. It's really encouraging when you see a guy who knows how to dress well because it means that he takes seriously what he looks like in the world and how he presents. It's such a nice thing when you go to dinner with your husband and he looks handsome and you look beautiful and you know that you guys are presenting this really confident, strong couple vibe to whoever you meet. And I think that really does attract the right kind of woman. Everything that you wear is a reflection of who you are on the inside. And so that also is an element of picking the style that you choose. You wanna find clothing that represents your personality and also represents your stability and responsibility. Abby puts a lot of emphasis on appearance, but 
dress for the occasion. There's nothing wrong with a t-shirt and jeans if that's what the occasion calls for. And make sure your clothes are clean and not riddled with holes. This doesn't only apparently attract the right kind of woman, but it's also good for you. It shows that you care enough about yourself to be mindful of what you're wearing, which can actually be said about everything on this list, but I'll get to that in a moment. And that leads me to number five. Aim to dress like a man and not dress like a man child. We live in a day and age where men and women wear athleisure all the time or wear pajamas, just straight pajamas. I see these high school students constantly literally wearing pajamas to school and I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what world we live in, but I don't accept this. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think this is a good reflection on our society. And if you want a woman worth marrying, you need to dress like a man. So don't wear clothing that's this new fangled kind of man-child look, where you look like you're wearing sweatpants and joggers and sneakers and t-shirts all the time. There is a time and a place. I would say 90% of the time that is the gym. But for the most part, a guy in a pair of jeans and a guy in a white button-down shirt is going to look a thousand times more attractive than a guy in the outfit I just mentioned. The guy who knows how to look like a man is going to attract a worthy woman. Women want men. A good woman wants a good man. She wants a man who looks like he has got it all figured out. Because if he has it figured out, that means on the days where she doesn't, he can kind of help and take the reins. And that's such a comforting feeling as a woman. So you want to dress in a way that shows a woman that you are a full-fledged human being. Like you know what you want and you are out there to get it. I find it odd that Abby says you should dress in a way that shows you are a full-fledged human being. Does she really think people who aren't dressed the way she thinks they should aren't fully human? I expect she meant full-fledged adult, but what a strange thing for such an ardent pro-birther to say. Anyway, I hate to be the one to tell Abby this, but we were wearing pajamas, or at least pajama pants, to school when I was in school over 20 years ago. I also hate to be the one to tell Abby this as well, but just because someone looks like they has their life together, it doesn't mean they actually do. I've known people who couldn't care less about their outward appearance but had their stuff together, and I've known people who were very careful about the image they presented to the world, and behind the scenes, their lives were a mess. But Abby is big on judging a book by their cover, and it is so interesting to me that Abby hates self-care, but all of the stuff on her list could be considered self-care. You are worthy of a shave and a trim, whichever you want, of the hair on your head and of the hair on your face. You are worthy of healthy foods and pursuing active hobbies you enjoy. You are worthy of clothes that are clean and that don't have holes in them. And it's just fine to do it because it makes you feel good and healthy and not because you're trying to attract a worthy woman. Of course, doing it for yourself will make it self-care and that's bad. I wonder if she's reconsidered her stance on self-care, but I would be willing to guess not. Anyway, I really don't understand Abby's way of thinking, but she leaves us with this. So everything that I'm talking about, all of the outward features that I'm talking about really are about what's on the inside and how a woman is going to take all the information, all of the markers, the visual markers of what you look like and figure out who you are deep down and what that means for a long-term future. No. You don't figure out what someone's appearance means for your long-term future. You don't guess about what the outside betrays about the inside. You get to know them and figure out if your values, morals, whatever, align if your personalities mesh. You can't tell how things are going to go because you met a well-dressed man with a clean haircut who looks like he goes to the gym. You can't tell someone is responsible because they look responsible. And what's really interesting to me is that Abby doesn't tell us what a worthy woman is, though I would think that would be the most important thing. Who are you trying to attract? What traits are important to you? What life goals do you need to share? I'm sure the reason I've titled this The Fundamental Shallowness Of is clear, but we've only just begun. And instead of talking about what traits make a good partner, Abby decides to tell us how to turn your apartment from a turn off to a turn on. Abby opens this video by noting that so many men have an apartment that indicates they're not ready to get married, and she's going to give five tips to turn the apartment around and make women think they can see a future with you. Because of your apartment? Those must be some really good tips. But first. Now, if you are new here, you might not know that I believe you should wait to have sex until you're married. So your apartment is not supposed to be a place where you're going to get a woman into bed and then that's the end of it. I find it strange that she felt the need to include that. But anyway, Abby says when dating, you'll probably end up seeing each other's apartments and she thinks it's important that your apartment is a reflection of who you are, what you can provide in a relationship and the stability you can have moving forward. 
that's a lot of pressure to put on an apartment. So I'm going to share with you five ways to make your apartment the best argument for why you will be a great husband. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to make that argument for yourself and not leave it up to your housing situation. Did I mention she says some weird things? Anyway, let's get into it. Number one is get your bed up off the floor, AKA decorate your apartment. So there's kind of this joke online that men just have their mattresses on the floor and don't even think about getting a bed frame. Don't be that guy. Decorate your apartment, make it look like you put some thought into it. That doesn't mean you have to spend a ton of money on pieces that you're not gonna keep forever, but having like a nice bed frame, even thrifting for some furniture makes such a big difference to the look of your apartment. If everything looks like junky and looks like you've had it since your college dorm room, it really gives off a vibe like you aren't going to be able to support and provide for a woman. It makes it look like you haven't put any thought into the space in which you live. And the space in which you live is very important, right? It sets the tone for your day, for your life. And I think if you can buy furniture, that's more a reflection of who you are. And again, it doesn't have to be expensive. You can find things on Amazon. On. You can find things at the thrift store. You can find things at Ikea even. As long as it looks clean, reflects you a little bit, and doesn't just look like college furniture, you are giving off an aura of you know who you are, what you can do, and that makes a woman feel a lot more comfortable and confident. I think if a woman walks into an apartment and she sees that the guy doesn't even care what kind of space he lives in, it really doesn't make her feel like, oh, I would like to live with this person. <laughs> but if she comes into an apartment that definitely has its own unique style, even if it's different from hers, then she's going to think, oh, well, he cares. And a guy who cares is a really attractive thing. I do think men should feel free to decorate their spaces, but if Abby thinks you should date for marriage and you should marry in your early 20s, I do think she's asking for a lot. I slept on a mattress on the floor until I was finally able to afford my own apartment at 29. I just didn't have the money for a bed frame. And since I moved so much, I didn't really have the interest in buying one as it would just be another thing to move. I wonder if it's occurred to her that some people just don't have the luxury of settling in one place for an extended period of time. Granted, I did create the immense privilege of Classically Abbey for a reason, but moving on to the next tip. Number two is clean your bathroom. And what I mean by that is really clean your apartment. But your bathroom is such a good place to start because if you have your entire house cleaned, your entire apartment cleaned, and you come into a bathroom and there's hair in the sink and beard shavings on the floor and dust in the corners, like it's really unattractive. It's really gross to come into somebody's bathroom and have it be disgusting. Cause theoretically a bathroom is supposed to be where you get clean. So I would say start with your bathroom. And if a girl comes in and sees that your bathroom is clean, she's gonna be like, this guy has got it figured out. I remember seeing somewhere that if the base around the toilet is clean, like where the little knobs are on the bottom that hold the screws in, that's how a woman knows that a guy's really got it together. So if you can even clean around there, around the baseboards, make sure your bathroom looks clean most of the time, that is going to make a really big difference to how you present yourself to somebody. But that applies to your whole apartment. Clean your kitchen, clean your bathroom, clean your bedroom, keep the house tidy, mop and sweep the floors and really keep that bathroom clean. Because if you can keep your bathroom and your home clean, it means you have enough time to dedicate to being an organized person. It means you don't live in chaos. And that is such a, a chef's kiss for a woman to see in a man is like, oh, he has got it together. I have to admit, I've never inspected the base of a toilet, but is it weird to just assume men clean their homes because they're, you know, adults? Why is this something you would do to impress a woman? Number three is stock your fridge with real food. If a woman looks in your fridge and all she sees is takeout boxes and garbage, like she's gonna think, oh, he doesn't really know how to cook for himself, take care of himself. But if she looks in your fridge and she sees Tupperwares of meal prep, she sees fresh fruit and vegetables, she sees seltzer cans that are like kind of organized. 
wow, that is a very attractive quality in a guy because that means he knows how to take care of himself physically, he's eating well, he's providing for himself, as opposed to the guy who is spending a ton of money on food that he can only eat once, right, take out. A guy who's ordering so much food out that he doesn't even care about what he's really putting into his body, right? He's not thinking about health. And if you know how to cook a little bit, that's also going to be helpful in a future relationship, in a marriage. So it's really lovely when a woman looks into a guy's fridge and sees what he actually has, right? What he eats, what he cooks, instead of just another box of Chinese food. All of these things, kind of like the way you look, also show to a woman what you have going on in your life. So decorating your apartment, keeping your bathroom clean, and having a fridge that's well stocked with good and healthy foods are all going to convey to a woman that you've got it figured out. I'm starting to think Abby is just going off her experiences because as a single person, my fridge isn't stocked with food. It would go bad before I had a chance to eat it. I work 40 hours a week and have a two hour commute, plus I get breakfast and lunch at work, so I have no need to keep a fully stocked fridge. And that is why you should get to know someone instead of just making assumptions based on their clothing or home decor, or apparently the contents of their fridge. Number four is put up pictures. Now, when I'm saying put up pictures, obviously art would fall more into the decor category, but I'm actually talking about having pictures of your friends and family. When I first went to my husband's apartment, I remember that he had so many photos of his family put up all around his apartment, and it really just warmed my heart. It made me feel so good to see how much he cared about the people in his life. And it made me think, wow, he's a guy who's really rooted, has good connections, cares a lot about people. If you have photos of your family and friends, you should definitely put them in frames and display them. It just shows how stable you are, how much a part of something you are. And it makes a woman feel like, oh, this guy isn't just a lone wolf. He's really like part of something bigger than himself. And any guy who considers himself in terms of relationships rather than just as an individual is also going to make a really good husband and father. So seeing photos of you with your family, seeing photos of you with your friends is a real good encouragement to a woman that you are tied down in the best way. You are tied down to the people around you, the people you love, and you want that moving forward. So that is a really good way to convey what you care about. And it's also lovely just to have photos of your friends and family around because they make us happy, don't they? In general, I don't have a problem with this, but I do find the conclusions she draws from it weird. Yes, having pictures of your friends and family around is nice, but she does a lot of assuming and well, those pictures don't mean he's interested in getting married or having kids or that he will be a good husband or father. This is why communication is important instead of making assumptions. Number five, and last but not least, is have more than just your TV as a center of entertainment. I think that a lot of the time when we live alone, we have a large television and that is kind of like the focus of our living room and it seems like that's all you do for entertainment in the evenings. And it can kind of feel, especially as a woman when you walk into a guy guy's apartment like doesn't he have anything else he's interested in does he only play video games does he only watch tv it's not that there isn't a place for those things but is that all he does so having some board games kind of displayed or just having to play or having some books on shelves to show that you read just having other things available around in your apartment that show your multitude of interests, because I'm sure you have many, is going to show a woman that the TV isn't the epicenter of your life. I know this sounds funny, but it can be a little like exhausting as a woman to see yet another television that is taking the attention of your boyfriend or your spouse away. And so saying, okay, well, I have a TV, yes, and we like to use it sometimes, yes, but we've got other things to do that we can use to spend time together. And we are interesting people and it's not just consuming content, but rather it's doing things and creating things. That's something women really like to see. Okay, but if a man genuinely enjoys reading board games, activities besides what's on TV, wouldn't he already have those items? Sometimes the things Abby says makes me wonder. And on that note. So those are five ways you can make your bachelor pad into your story and mood board in a sense of like, here's why you should date me. Here's why I'm a good fit for you. And here's why I would be a good husband and father. Who needs to get to know someone when their apartment can tell you all you need to know? These are the kinds of things that people don't wanna talk about that 
First impressions make a really big difference. Yes, but if you're going to someone's apartment, you've probably already gotten an impression of them. Sure, if your home is really bad, that can be a turnoff no matter how great an impression you made, but not having pictures of your family or friends or not having board games or not having your fridge stocked with fresh food probably isn't going to make or break it. This also depends on your age. There are things you expect of 30-somethings that you don't of 20-somethings. Honesty is also important. If you have an apartment full of books you don't read, games you don't play, food you don't eat, what's the point? And so if you can take the time to make a first impression that's really good, then you might end up convincing that girl you really like that you are a chance worth taking. I really don't think anyone has ever been convinced to stay with someone because of their apartment. But again, all of this could also be the self-care stuff Abby hates. You are worthy of sleeping in a proper bed, of a clean home, of hobbies, of comfort, and those are things you should do for yourself not to impress some woman you haven't even met yet. Also, if you're doing it just to attract a worthy woman, is it real or are you just faking it in the hopes that someone will like you? I would say open and honest communication is more important and it's so weird because Abby has to believe in discussing future goals, plans, and so on, but instead, she chose to focus on looking like a good potential partner, not the skills and personality and everything else that actually being one would involve. Anyway, I would like for my 18.2% of male viewers to let us know, did you find Abby's advice helpful? From here, we're moving from the advice to the video that made me decide to do a video, five women you should never date. And yes, that is me in my thumbnail. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing a five women that you should avoid at all costs. Five women who are dangerous, who are not someone you want to date or get married to because they are not the woman for you. They are not the woman who is going to give you that long-term relationship that you are looking for, who will be a good mother to your children, who will be a good wife to you. Yes, all women have the potential to change, but if you are starting to date these women at the point at which they are very strongly in these areas of their lives, I would not recommend it. This cracks me up. There are people who wouldn't be good partners to me and who I wouldn't be a good partner to because of fundamental differences in lots of areas. That does not mean they're dangerous. I do agree you shouldn't date someone thinking you can change them, but again, someone you're not compatible with isn't dangerous. Though, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Number one, you might have guessed it, is girl bosses. <laughs> if you are new to my channel, I am somebody who talks about how I think that the girl boss mentality is a really big problem in today's day and age. I think that so many women get sucked into this idea that the only way that they can fulfill their potential is by going out, getting to the highest level of their careers. Most people don't reach the highest level of their career, and I feel pretty confident saying that most people don't want to. And while we're here, let's look at some stats. From a 2023 Pew Research poll, though not women specific, 39% of workers feel that their job is an extremely or very important part of their overall identity. 62% say it's extremely important to have a job that offers paid time off. 10.4% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are women. And of the 30 female CEOs that have their own page on Wikipedia's list of women CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, five don't have kids. So let's stop pretending that female CEOs are a big thing when they're actually still a very small portion of the population. And let's stop pretending that being a female CEO means you can't marry or can't have kids. They're actually not mutually exclusive and Abby knows that. She just doesn't like that these women aren't sacrificing their ambitions for their kids. And ignoring all of the things that make them women. Getting married, being in relationships, putting others before themselves, having children, all of that. And there it is. It doesn't matter if a woman is married or has kids, if they're CEOs, that means they're not putting their kids or spouses before themselves. Therefore, they're ignoring what makes them women. And who knew womanhood was defined by our relationships to others and our lack of care for ourselves? And let's remember that this message is to men. So Abby is telling her male viewers, however many there are, that they actually need to find someone who's willing to sacrifice herself so she can be a good wife and mother. That's a terrible expectation to put on someone. If you are dating a girl who thinks that being a girl boss is the most important part of her life, who doesn't care about your relationship as much as she cares about her job, who doesn't care about having children because it would slow her down, or who thinks that she can wait till she's in her late 30s to start trying, that is not the woman for you. Yes, if you're looking for someone who wants to marry, who wants to be a stay-at-home mother, or just generally isn't interested in the corporate ladder, then a woman who doesn't want kids until her 30s, if at all, who is interested in climbing that ladder, isn't for you. And that's okay. 
but it has nothing to do with being a girl boss and Abby should check herself. Isn't it classic to respect your elders? Honestly, I think when Abby envisions girl bosses, she's thinking of Instagram influencers in big city apartments, not the CEO of General Motors. You do not want to date a woman who is going to put her career so far ahead of everything else. As I always say, success is holistic. Success is Good family, good career, good marriage, good children, all of that together is what makes a person successful. And again, career can be up and down in those levels, right? Because a stay-at-home mom has a perfectly holistic, successful life. But if you have a woman who's talking about how important her career is, and she's saying that that is going to come at the cost of everything else, you don't want to be in a relationship with someone like that because you are always going to be playing second fiddle to what her career could give her. And she is not going to recognize until it's too late that she wants a family, that she wants to be a part of something bigger than herself. And it really is a selfish pursuit to want to be a girl boss more than anything else. And it's not her fault. That's the narrative that the media sells us, that that's the path to true happiness. But at the end of the day, the path to true happiness is our relationships. Of course, if you're not living life the way Abby thinks you should, you're simultaneously selfish and also just following what media tells you. Because, of course, woman's default state is wife and mother and anything else is because media said. And she is telling men that women pursuing a career are selfish. That's great. And I have to say, before I move on from this one, I don't entirely buy this. Abby says girl boss, which is infantilizing women, but given how she describes it, I would assume means a woman who has reached the top of her career. However, given the things Abby has said previously about women working and how she thinks women should stay home with their kids unless they have to work, I do think she's referring to women who have careers in general, wherever they are on the corporate ladder and whether or not they want to move to the C-suite. And I just want to say, it is not shameful to have a job or career. It is not shameful to want a job or career. And it is not shameful to enjoy a job or career. It is okay for a woman, even a woman who is a mother, to not lose herself in the role of mom. Now we can move on. The second woman you should avoid at all costs is a woman who says proudly that she cannot cook. Cannot handle this, do not like this as a concept, cannot get behind it. If you are a woman who doesn't know how to cook, that's okay. A lot of women grew up with moms who didn't know how to cook and so they didn't really learn. But you always have the potential to learn how to cook, right? That's, that's the great thing about being a human is that there's a potential to learn a lot of things, a whole host of things. And yet Abby proudly refuses to learn anything beyond her limited worldview. And if you are somebody who is proudly going on about how you can't cook, that's a woman who is not willing to learn. That's a woman who only orders takeout or depends on her husband to cook. Now, I'm not saying a man can't cook. My husband and I actually split those duties because he enjoys cooking over time. He has learned to cook and he enjoys it. And there are times I'm really busy with the kids and it just, it doesn't get done. But I think that there is something to a woman saying she proudly cannot boil water. That's very unattractive. This might blow Abby's mind, but a man proudly saying he can't boil water would also be unattractive. Not knowing how to cook is one thing, but an adult being proud of being unable to perform basic adult tasks isn't attractive in general. And is not does not bode well for your relationship because what she's saying really is that she's not domestic. And domesticity is a really important part of being in a marriage. Being part of a marriage is taking care of a household together. <laughs> and if you are married to someone who's like, I'm not domestic, I don't know how to cook, I don't know how to clean, you're going to be cleaning up after that person your entire life. You're going to be ordering out take out much more than you would probably prefer. And you're going to have an element in the home of like disdain towards the house, towards the homemaking element. And that is not healthy for a family. You want the family to love being home, to enjoy the meals that they eat, to enjoy being in a house that's clean. And you will find that a woman who at least is open to learning how to cook is a much, much better option. Cooking increased overall from 2003 to 2016. The percent of college educated men cooking increased from 37.9% in 2003 to 51.9% in 2016, but men with less than high school education who cook did not change. 33.2% in 2016. College educated women who cook increased from 64.7% in 2003 to 68.7% in 2016, while women with less than high school education had no change. 72.3% in 2016. Women with less education spent more time cooking per day than high educated women, but the reverse was true for men. Number three is a woman with unnaturally colored hair. If you see a woman with purple hair, green hair, blue hair, hair colors that don't naturally occur in nature, 
That is not a woman you want to date. That is a woman you're going to want to avoid. I'll tell you why. Because a woman like that is giving you a signal that she's really not interested in attracting the typical kind of guy. I have to admit, when I put the teal and purple streaks in my hair, and when I considered doing mermaid hair, I wasn't thinking about men or what men would find attractive. I just thought it looked pretty. Most typical guys are attracted to a woman who has a normal hair color, blonde, brunette, or red. And most typical guys wanna get married and have a family. A girl with blue hair, green hair, pink hair, any color under the sun that isn't one of the natural colors is basically saying, I don't wanna have a normal life. I don't wanna get married and have children. I don't wanna be with a guy who just wants to raise our family in our nice suburb, is part of a community. She's saying, I'm different. I'm different. Breaking news, Abby doesn't like it when people are different. And that is not always the best, right? Because it's not a problem to actually have some different stances, or there are some exceptions to the rule of women who just think it's fun to get pink or purple hair. But, but those women are either A, sending out a signal on purpose that they are not interested in your typical guy, or B, they are so unaware of what they are attracting that that probably isn't a good fit for you either. You wanna choose a woman whose hair color is representative of where she's at in life. She's got a hair color that's kinda typical because she knows that a typical life doesn't mean a boring life. A typical life means a full, loving life. And it doesn't have to be traveling in a van or being in Bora Bora every other week. It means being home with your family. And that is what's going to really be valuable in your day to day. Abby really has a wild imagination, doesn't she? When I put the red and blonde streaks in my hair, when I did the teal and purple, when I started dyeing my hair red, I wasn't thinking of Bora Bora or van life. I just wanted to change things up and see how it looked. It really wasn't that complicated. Granted, I don't want to marry or have kids, so I guess that was me overtly expressing that. I just didn't know it. And now that I'm letting my hair grow out naturally, well, I guess I'm going to be confusing them with my lack of desire to marry, have kids, or live in a suburb. But my hair is its natural color. How can that be? So I would say typically avoid the girl with crazy colored hair. I would also say avoid the crazy hair color because crazy hair colors are very expensive to maintain, which means she probably isn't great with money. I would like to note that Abby is literally judging an imaginary person. She's not talking about anyone specific. She's just assuming that a woman who dyes her hair on natural colors, in addition to all the other horrific things like not wanting kids, is bad with money. I can't even bring myself to judge real people that hard, but it's like a hobby for Abby. The fourth woman you should avoid at all costs is a woman who's an atheist. I think women who don't believe in God are not a good fit for you right now. A woman who's an atheist can come to God. That is not to say that at some point she can't become religious. But what it does mean is that she is in a place right now where she doesn't put faith, family, and community first. Wait, what? How does being an atheist mean you don't value family or community? Faith and community are often inextricably linked. So if you want to be part of a good and thriving community, you are going to want to be a part of a faith community. And if you are marrying a woman who is an atheist, that is going to pull you away from all of the support you're going to need as you and your wife have a family. So first, there are communities outside of faith-based ones. And second, just because two people enter a marriage believing in God, that doesn't mean it will always be that way. And Third, just because one spouse is an atheist, that doesn't mean the other will be forced to give up faith-based activities. It really depends on the people and religion involved. It takes a very specific kind of person to be an atheist. Believing in God is, is important to how you raise your family. It's important to the values that you hold. And I think if you are dating a woman who's an atheist, you aren't looking towards the future of what your life will hold for you. Being part of a religious community, believing in God, those are the things you are going to raise your children with. Those are the values and morals you're going to be raising your family with. And if you don't have a wife who's on board with that, that means that your children are not going to have those things. And yes, you can be a moral atheist. Yes, you can have values as an atheist, but it's a lot harder when you don't have God undergirding all those things. It's actually not. And it's very difficult to raise a family in today's day and age that has good, strong morals if both mom and dad are atheists. Citation needed. Of course, if Abby doesn't agree with your morals, that means they're not good. So a citation probably wouldn't mean much. It's much easier to say, this is what's good and right. And here is where you're going to find your strength in times of difficulty, right here with God. I see. 
Abby thinks it's easier to have morals and values if you're religious because you're told what your morals and values will be. You don't have to think it through yourself. So find a woman who's not only not an atheist, but actually shares your faith. And that's a whole other video, but it's really important to find someone who shares your faith. I would agree that if faith is important to you, you should find someone who shares it. But if you don't need a specific wedding ceremony or to raise your kids, if you want them a certain way, it's not that important. The more important thing I would say is to ensure your morals and values align. Number five, the fifth woman you should avoid at all costs is a woman who says she doesn't want kids. This can be a girl boss. This can be a woman who just doesn't think that children are of interest to her, but don't date this woman. This woman is not for you. Someone recently-ish left a comment on an Abby video asking what if men don't want kids and here's the answer. That's simply not allowed. Men and women must want kids. You want to date a woman who wants to have children. Having children is so important and it brings so much joy and so much fulfillment to your world. And if you find a woman who says she's not interested in having children, that is a very unnatural state for 95% of women. It's not an unnatural state for them. It's simply who they are. And it is not something you wanna to have to contend with when you get to the point at which you actually are trying to start a family. You don't want to be married to someone who is like, I never wanted kids in the first place. Yeah, that's why you should talk about those things before you get married, which Abby knows as she mentioned that in the one advice video she did. You wanna be married to a woman who is so excited to be a mom because your children need their mother. Your children are going to need their mother. And if you A, don't have children when you want them, you're going to resent your spouse. And B, if you have children with a woman who didn't wanna be a mom, you're giving your children a worse chance of having a really important relationship be solid and stable. So Abby does know that kids born to unwilling parents is actually not a good thing for the kid. She just chooses to ignore it as she declares that motherhood shouldn't be a choice. I mean, I don't know what's more attractive than finding a partner who you can see be the parent to your children, right? Like as a woman, I saw my husband and I was thinking to myself, he's gonna be a great dad. He saw me and he thought she's gonna be a great mom. You wanna marry someone who's going to be a good parent to your children. And if there is a woman who says she's not interested in having children, that is a huge red flag. Not wanting kids isn't a red flag. If you want kids, it's a sign of incompatibility, but it's not a red flag. Most women wanna have kids. Most women are really nurturing. It's very innate to femininity. And it's really a beautiful thing when a woman gets to become a mother. And a woman who rejects that entirely is, there is, a, there is something to be examined there. It may be under the guise of girl boss. That could be what it is. And she just wants to fulfill her potential elsewhere, which I don't usually recommend. But even in that case, that's not a person you can build a life with. Yes, if you want kids and someone doesn't, that means you shouldn't be dating or marrying them because you're incompatible in an important way. That doesn't mean something is wrong with that person or that they need to be examined or that something went wrong somewhere. Some people just don't want to have kids. My goodness. But that's it for the five dangerous women men should avoid. Women who don't want kids, women with unnatural hair colors, women with careers, women who don't cook, atheists. So dangerous, so scary. What's actually scary is that I think it comes naturally to Abby to be so judgmental. But from here, we'll move on to a message from men to women delivered by Abby. It's titled, Three Things Men Want Women to Know. They're actually super sweet, and I'm not sure if she means men are super sweet or the three things are. I'm also not sure where Abby got these three things from. She's apparently doing this video. Because lately, women have been hating on men. Now, it's not just the feminist movement. Of course, that's really the start of everything. But we've gotten to this complaining place of like, men are the worst. They don't do A, B, or C. They don't really take care of us. They don't do a lot of things. There's even the conversation of something called the great divorce that's coming because women are just done. That is crazy talk. Men are wonderful. And there are so many great men out there. And just like there are men out there who suck, there are women out there who suck. There's no blanket statements about genders here, right? Abby makes blanket statements about gender all the time, but please do go off. Men are not unequivocally perfect and neither are women, but there are so many wonderful men out there. And I think it's so important for us to teach our young women that there are actually great guys and that 
They want what's best for you in the right situations. Something Abby has a hard time understanding is that no one gets to decide what's best for someone else. Of course, we're not talking about sleeping with someone before you're married and, and trusting someone beyond the boundaries of what's normal. But once you get married for sure, you should be trusting the guy that you married because you chose him for a reason. I have a theory that folks like Abby, Brett Cooper, Girl Defined, you get the idea, actively look for and engage with rage bait. And that's how they come up with these ideas that girl bossing is all the rage, the great divorce is coming, because those are the types of content they interact with. And the algorithm picks up on that and just feeds them more of it. I've not seen all this girl bossing they like to talk about. I've never seen anything about the great divorce. And Google is only pulling up a book by C.S. Lewis. So honestly, I think they're all falling prey to the outrage algorithm. And hey, it works for them. So they don't care to see if what they're saying is actually a reflection of reality. Anyway, let's find out what men want women to know. The first thing that men really want you to know is that they want to make you happy. Men love to see their girlfriends and their wives happy. They just love it. That's their joy in life, is to make their women happy. It is right and normal for people to want to make their spouse happy, but one, a spouse is not a random person. Abby should have titled this, Three Things Husbands and Boyfriends Want Their Wives and Girlfriends to Know. And two, making someone else happy shouldn't be anyone's joy in life. You can't be responsible for someone else's happiness. You can contribute to it, but you can't be their sun and moon and stars. That is too much responsibility and really it's a game you can only lose. The whole concept of men saving women, rescuing women, wanting to solve their problems, it's because they love seeing that smile that comes across their woman's face as they see something get better for them. Please don't confuse fiction with reality. They want to see you joyful and happy. So what does that mean? It means that men will go out of their way to make you happy. There have been times where my husband has seen me unhappy and he's gone and done something I didn't even ask him to do just because he loves me and he wants to see me smile. And it's so meaningful when your husband really goes out of his way to do those things that are going to bring you joy. Now, what does that mean for women? There are two things that means for women, for you. Number one, it means that you have to actually understand that that's what your husband wants for you and give him the credit for that and appreciate that about him. I think so many women fall into the trap of thinking that their husbands are narcissists or their husbands don't care about their happiness when that's not true at all. So basically, if Abby sees a woman complain about her marriage, Abby assumes the woman is full of shit and just doesn't appreciate her husband. Cool. Men will really go out of their way to do something that makes their wives happy. If that means making a little extra money so that their wives can go get their nails done, they're going to do that. If it means that they can help with chores around the house, but you ask in a really feminine and loving way rather than in a bossy, nagging way. I have a question. Why does a wife have to ask the husband, in a specific way, no less, to help out with household chores? Doesn't he live there as well? Or is Abby only addressing women who stay home after marriage? They will do that for you because they like to see that it makes you happy. Not that they are doing something that you told them to do and now they just did it and they get no credit. Instead, you asking them or you showing them in a loving way that what they did means something, that that chore that they did for you means something and makes you happy, brings you joy, that's what they're looking for. Let me get this straight. Men don't want to do something you told them to do and they get no credit for doing. Instead, you ask or show in a loving way that what they did means something, makes you happy, brings you joy. That's what men are looking for. This doesn't work. If you're doing something for a reward, and a reward can be someone else expressing joy or happiness that you did the thing, you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for yourself to get that reward. I like to do things for people. I like to make people happy. I don't expect anything except a thank you. And if that thing I did was a chore, you're just doing chores. And not only that, but washing the dishes, vacuuming the carpet, taking out the trash, whatever, that not only benefits your partner, but it also benefits you. So why would you express happiness over your partner doing a chore? It sounds as though you're bribing a child. Abby's low opinion of, well, people strikes again. She thinks men are children to be bribed and women are ungrateful harpies who have to be told how to treat their husbands. What it really means for you is ask and expect things from a place of joy and happiness and appreciation rather than nagging and annoyance and tiredness that they didn't get it the first time. And number two, what it means is that being sad and low and grumpy 
is a very, it's kind of like a dagger in the heart for men. Like it, it hurts them to see their wives and their girlfriends sad and down. Now that's not to say if you are sad and down, you can't show that, that's not what I mean. But what I mean is if you are constantly complaining, if you are constantly making it seem like your husband cannot make you happy, at a certain point, he's going to feel like, I don't really want to try. And so it's your job to encourage that in him because it is so natural. And women have such a tendency, and I say this as someone who does this myself, to expect more from a man than he is aware of. And so he doesn't even know that that's what's on the docket. He doesn't even know that you expect that. And so when you get grumpier and grumpier because he's not doing something he doesn't know he's supposed to do, then he starts to feel like he's failing you and he doesn't really want to fail all the time. I love this. Men want to make you happy. It's you who's making that impossible. How is he supposed to know what will make you happy? And if you don't ask him things in a sweet way, how is he supposed to listen? If you don't react with joy and happiness every time he does something, how is he supposed to know he did it right? Again, Abby thinks men are children and women are ungrateful harpies. Instead, showing what you want, asking for what you want, and phrasing it in the best way, which is, I would love if you did this. That is going to make him so much happier because he wants to make you happy. If a man doing something to make you happy is contingent on you telling or showing him and you telling or showing in a correct way, I have doubts about how happy that man wants to make you. It's too easy to say, well, you didn't make me feel appreciated, so I didn't do it because you wouldn't appreciate it anyway. The second thing that men want you to know is that they have their own way of doing things and you aren't smarter or better than they are. I say this with love because I get it. As a woman, we feel like we know best. Abby just finished telling us that we have to tell and or show men things that need to be done, but okay. It's really difficult, right? Like we know how to do the laundry. We know how to fold it. We have a certain way that we like things done. And when our husbands don't do things the way we like them, we think you don't know how to do it at all. But men have their own way of doing things and they are good at those things, but maybe not in the exact way that we anticipate. Now there are things that men aren't so good at that some men are better at and some men are worse at, but there are things that men do, they just do differently. And if you care so much about it, you can do it yourself. So what I mean by this is if your husband does laundry and he folds the laundry in a different way than you do, and it matters to you, that's your chore now. You get to do that chore, but he can do the laundry, he can fold it, he just doesn't do it the same way that you like. So if it matters so much for you to have it done in a specific way, number one, do it yourself. Or number two, you can ask him to try it your way. And if he doesn't do it your way, then do it yourself. It's something that's more important to you that you get it done in a specific way than that it gets done at all. So for men, they want you to know they have done laundry before. They have washed dishes before. It may not be exactly what you want. It may not be exactly the way that you approach it, but they know how to do it. And they have their stuff that they're much better at than we are, right? They know how to change the oil in the car, or they know how to find the best contractors to do the jobs around the house when you wouldn't want to do the research even for a second. Men have their own approaches to things that are different than women's. And I think a lot of the time in a marriage, it's very easy to say, I as a woman know more than a man and I can do it better. And there are things that you may like done a certain way, but it isn't necessarily better. And if it is better, then do it yourself. Otherwise, let him do it his own way. It's okay. It's okay to be a little more loosey goosey sometimes and let your husband have his own approach to things. If it means that you go out to dinner with your friends and you come back and the kids had mac and cheese for dinner instead of something you would have prepared instead, that's okay, he's allowed to do that sometimes. It's okay for dads to do things a little differently, for husbands to do things a little differently. And that doesn't make you better or smarter than they are. I do agree with the core message that just because you do things one way, that doesn't make you better or smarter than someone who does it a different way. And I'll just leave it at that. Though I'm not really sure, men want you to know you're not smarter or better is a sweet message. Anyway. The third thing that men want you to know is that they love the things about you that make you different from them. Men love that women are different than they are. They don't want to be married to a man. They want to be married to a woman. And so that means there are some beautiful things about womanhood that you can embrace and your husband will just absolutely love. I'll be honest, I didn't think this would be included in those sweet messages because to be honest, I'm so glad you're a woman and different from me. It's not sweet. It's actually weird, but maybe I'm being unfair. Let me know in the comments if something you appreciate about your partner is that they're the opposite sex. 
Now I'm talking about vulnerability, I'm talking about beauty, and I'm talking about femininity. Women are more naturally vulnerable. And a good man wants to see your vulnerability at the times that it is that it is necessitated. That's not to say that a woman should be weak all the time or that she can't ever be strong for herself. But there are times that women need to be vulnerable. There are times that he says something that hurts your feelings. There are times that the stressors of every day are hard. And you being vulnerable is a beautiful aspect of womanhood where your husband can come in and can take care of you and can make you happy simply by listening. And that's something men love about women is that they can just be their solace in times of vulnerability. Abby coming in hot with those gender roles, but hot take, partners should feel able to be vulnerable with one another. It shouldn't be something only women are able to express. And the way Abby frames it is kind of alarming. Men like to see a woman's vulnerability. That sets off red flags. Partners should, of course, be there for one another. But the idea that women are the vulnerable sex and men like to see it, something about it strikes me as off. Number two is beauty. One of the really fun parts of being a woman is embracing our beauty and doing our hair and doing our makeup and shaving our legs. Shaving your legs is not fun. And wearing beautiful clothing. Now, that's not necessary for being a woman, but it is a fun part of being a woman. And for most men, that difference, that attraction, is something they really value in their women. And there's a reason that men love sundresses in the summer because it's such a feminine thing and shows how womanly you are. It's so funny Abby says this because when I was a kid, I always thought it sucked for boys that they had to wear boring clothes and couldn't play with bright, vibrant colors which is ridiculous. The only thing stopping men from playing with their beauty is people like Abby, who believe men should live vicariously through a female partner when it comes to this sort of thing, because that's what people like Abby are comfortable with. The last part of womanhood that men just love to see is the nurturing element of femininity. That nurturing part of you that wants to take care of others that is something men value so deeply. And that's why husbands love their wives when they see them become mothers. They love seeing their wives take care of the, of the person that's now the most important to them, their child, their baby. So embracing that nurturing part of yourself and engaging with it, whether that be toward your husband or toward your children, is just something that men value so much. I don't think Abby knows this, but men can be nurturers as well, and not just of their bank accounts. I do enjoy how gendered this list was. And yet Abby claimed in a previous video that we don't gender things here. Sure, Abby. And now on to the last video where Abby declares what you should wear to get a man's attention. Abby tells us the five pieces of clothing that will catch a man's eye for all the right reasons. And right up front. In today's video, we're going to be talking about five pieces of clothing that men love to look at. And we're not talking about just sexy clothes. We're not just talking about bathing suits or low cut things or really short and tight things. Because on my channel, we talk about fashion from a modest perspective. I think being modest is absolutely wonderful. I think it's beautiful. I think it brings respect to a woman's body and it gets a woman what she really wants. For anyone wondering, Abby thinks what women really want is marriage. And apparently modest clothing will get you there. I've discussed Abby's distorted views on modesty before, so I'll just leave it at that and link my The Authoritarian Tendencies of Classically Abby video in the cards. Moving on. I think that men subconsciously can look at a woman in these pieces of clothing and think, she looks really beautiful. She looks really attractive. I'd like to get to know that woman. I would again like to request that my 18.2% male audience dig into their subconscious and let us know if there's something about these clothing items that really catches their eye. Also, ladies, these items will change your closet and subtly attract a good man. And I'm sure we're all waiting with bated breath. So the first item is the sundress. A sundress is really, really attractive to men. And the reason for that is that it is so absolutely feminine. It's not trying to be sexy. If you're wearing a normal sundress, you are not trying to be sexy. But what you are doing is you're just exuding your femininity. You are showing how different you are from men. You are showing all of the best parts of being a woman. And it's very flattering. Usually they pin in at the waist and kind of flow out from there. And that is one of the most flattering cuts on every body type. So sundresses really are attractive to men 
for kind of the actual physical reason and for the emotional reason. The physical reason being it's very flattering, it's attractive, and from an emotional perspective, it just gives off that carefree feminine vibe that men love, right? It just looks like you are ready to go for a picnic or you are ready to go do something just lovely for the day. It occurred to me while listening, how does Abby know these are men's preferences and that's how men view these items? I've never heard of someone attaching an emotional response to a dress before, even a sundress. I do like, however, that she makes sure to admonish us not to be sexy. I suppose it might shock Abby to know that some men find a carefree attitude sexy. And if you're wondering what defines a sexy sundress, there are some on the market that I would say veer into sexy territory. They're too short, they're too tight, they're too low cut. Honestly, this sounds exhausting. I wear what I feel comfortable in and I don't worry if other people think it's too sexy. And Abby knows quite well that it doesn't matter what you wear. Some people will just find everything sexy. Trying to dress according to a judgmental crowd of strangers is a no-win situation and it gives strangers way too much power. Anyway, the next item is strappy heels. Now I'm not talking about the kind of strappy heels that like have buckles and leather and look kind of like a dominatrix. That's not what we're talking about here. That would be sexy and sexy is bad. What I am talking about are, there are kind of two different avenues here. There are these Thai strappy sandals that have become popular lately that are very, very pretty and kind of come up the leg a little bit. And then there are simple strappy heels that just have a band in the front and a band around the ankle. Both of those are really attractive. They show off your leg, making it look longer just because it's a heel in the first place. A heel always makes your leg look more attractive. It accentuates the muscle in your leg, but then the straps themselves accentuate your leg because it shows off skin in a very sensual way. It's not immodest it's a little bit sensual. And I think that that is what gives off that attractive vibe. Sensual has to do with the five senses, but it comes with a hint of lewdness, a suggestion of sex. So sexy is bad, but sensual is fine. Let's be honest, Abby just wants people to wear what she thinks is pretty, what she thinks is classy, and she's using modesty to give her opinions some sort of authority. The next item Abby likes, but is pretending it's men's preference, is flowy skirts. Skirts just generally, skirts and dresses, they're just kind of uncommon today, right? Women are always in leggings or in pants. I think that depends on where you are. I've noticed a mixture. But skirts and dresses are just inherently a little more attractive. They show off the feminine form in a very different way than men. And it just, it, it just is a very female item of clothing. And a flowy skirt is the epitome of that, right? Like a pencil skirt still has that structure. And again, it comes off a little more business-like, whereas a flowy skirt, is much more swishy and sensual and flowy, and that is very attractive. It kind of brings attention to your body without it actually bringing attention to your body because it's not about it clinging to your curves. It's more that as your skirt moves and flows, it kind of flows around you in a really attractive way. Abby puts a lot of emphasis on showing off the feminine form in a modest way, of course. And I would like to know how she knows this sort of showing off is attracting the good attention instead of the bad attention. I suppose because less skin is involved, but as I, and I would bet most women, including Abby herself, know, you can be wearing the most unfeminine outfit of all time, showing no skin, and you will still have a man leering at you. I hate this talk so much. Anyway, Anyway, the next item is a flattering sweater. Because it kind of flatters and accentuates without showing skin. Now, I'm not talking about a skin tight sweater because to be honest, that isn't super flattering, but a sweater that fits you correctly, that fits the arms right, that may be a turtleneck depending on your body type, or that has some sort of decoration that just makes your figure look attractive, fitted without being skin tight, is very flattering, is very attractive because it gives an impression of your body without it showing off everything. Someone wearing clothes that properly fits them is attractive, but it's not this shortcut to good attention or marriage like Abby claims, and I wish she would stop trying to sell this to her audience. In my opinion, it offers a false sense of security that, oh, I'm dressing modestly, so he's interested in me as a person, not as a body, and he respects me. And then if that turns out not to be true, it's, I must not have been modest enough. He saw a hint of skin and was just driven mad with lust, so he couldn't respect me. I've said it before, and and Abby's men's series really cemented it for me, but Abby has a very low opinion of men and of women. 
Really, I think Abby considers herself above most people, which is why she chooses to lecture her audience, but it is so pronounced in these videos. Anyway, I thought this was kind of funny. And that is really the most attractive thing about wearing clothing is giving an idea of what's underneath, essentially. You don't need to show off your entire figure wearing something really, really revealing in order for a guy to be attracted to you. Wearing the right clothing is about that game, finding that line of showing off what you look like without revealing everything. Because you want a guy to notice that you have a nice figure, but you don't want him to know exactly what you look like when you're totally nude. That isn't the point. So in short, the point is to suggest sex. You shouldn't dress sexy, but you should suggest sex. This makes no sense, but moving on, the fifth item is a silky date night number. Some sort of silky dress is always going to look super attractive to men because it skims off of your body in a really attractive way. It doesn't need to be super tight. It's not about you ne needing to wear something that is like gonna show every lump and bump. It's the fabric is a very feminine fabric and it's very kind of sultry the way that silk moves. So wearing a silky dress that can be completely covered. I've worn silk skirts that are midi length and then I wear a sweater on top or I wear a shirt on top that covers everything. That is a very attractive fabric and it looks really nice on the body. So wearing that, it just gives this little hint of something and it's very attractive to men, especially if you do it in like a red, a red silk dress. Like, mm, it's gonna look so good. Like, it's gonna look so good. I think I'll refrain from commenting on this one. Anyway, the bonus item per Abby's husband is a floppy giant hat because apparently he would definitely notice a woman wearing a big hat. That was it for this video. To reiterate, men find sundresses, strappy heels, flowy skirts, a flattering sweater, and a silky date night number, and maybe a big floppy hat attractive. And remember, these items must be sensual, not sexy. One is good and the other is bad. And my goodness, this is ridiculous and exhausting. After going through these videos, it's apparent to me that Abby considers herself the arbiter of the right way to live and the rest of us are just lost souls that she has to lecture. That people are different, that gender doesn't have to be strictly defined or adhered to. I don't know if it's just not a consideration or it's something she doesn't think is important, but it is telling that she thinks women who step outside the norm are dangerous to men. She doesn't like it when media tells women they have options outside of marriage and motherhood, not realizing or not caring that women can come to those conclusions themselves and aren't brainwashed by magazines. And she doesn't want women giving men the impression that marriage and parenthood is optional either, which also ties into how conservatives are trying to squash anything outside of being straight and cis being mentioned in schools. They're truly afraid that if kids know trans people exist or gay people and so on, they won't just follow the path of marry someone of the opposite sex and have kids. They want kids to think there's only one way to live a happy and fulfilling life. And if they don't follow that one way, they will be miserable. And they do their best to make that a reality by making life for members of the LGBTQ plus as miserable as they can. And now seems like a good time to remind everyone that Abby's husband, Jacob Roth, was an intern for the Heritage Foundation, the main driver behind Project 2025. They want the US to be remade in their image and they don't care how anyone else feels about it. Their way is better and we will get in line or, well, let's hear what Heritage Foundation president and author of Project 2025, Kevin Roberts, has to say. I come full circle in this response and just want to encourage you with some substance that we are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Right on. Thank you, brother. That's a threat if I've ever heard one. And take note of the background decor for the Real America's Voice host. Lots of Jesus paraphernalia, a small American flag, and a sign that reads, there are no conspiracies, but there are no coincidences. Subtle. I think that's it. Just please remember that no matter how sweet and well-meaning these biblical values pro-patriarchy, we just want women to be happy people come across. This is what they support. And there is no live and let live in Project 2025.